In today's A Complete Guide to Four-Wheel Drive, we discuss the effects of tyre pressures. We look at some more basic off-road driving techniques. Ted Garstang from Bilstein talks about gas shock absorbers. Stuart Bailey discusses the safari snorkel. And to end the show, our Kalahari convoy heads west. One of the first principles we need to understand before we go off-road is the effect of tyre pressures on the terrain over which we drive and the vehicle's performance. Firstly, a tyre that is very, very hard will tend to penetrate through. A tyre that is soft will tend to float. Now, for sand driving, such as this morning, the sand is actually quite wet, so it's got a lot of buoyancy. The vehicle, even with fairly hard tyres, does not sink in. But the moment the sand gets soft, a hard tyre will penetrate through, making driving difficult. So the first question is, what surface are we driving over? And how will our tyres penetrate? If they're going to penetrate a lot and reduce the power pull, absorb the power from the vehicle, then we're going to need to lower our tyre pressures. Now we're going to go sand driving today. And the first thing we're going to do is look at the condition of the sand. And here the sand in some places is quite compact, but where it's soft, we're going to battle. So we're going to drop the tyre pressures. Our first port of call is one bar. We can go lower or we could go higher, but it's a good starting point. So I suggest that one bar is where we are going to start today. So to do that, we need a tyre pressure gauge. Okay, it's the first thing you're going to buy at any off-road 4x4 shop. You're going to buy a tyre pressure gauge. It's the first thing you're going to need. Okay, one bar, good starting point. What actually happens when you let down a tyre? Imagine this. This is a tyre, it's kind of roundish, driving along the road. And there's the road surface. That's the layer on the road. Let down the tyre and it softens. Actually, well, there becomes the road, a new road surface there. That's the new footprint, much longer. Many people assume it's the fact that the tyre gets wider and that is what helps with flotation. Not really, because a radial tyre actually bends in at the bottom. So yes, it gets a bit wider, but a wide tyre has a higher rolling resistance and that's not where the advantage is. The advantage is here. A long footprint. But there's more to it than that. I want to talk now about tyre pressures on hard ground. Hard stony ground where the rocks and stones threaten the tyre sidewalls. I'm going to demonstrate something quite interesting to you now. The idea here is that if you lower your tyre pressures down to a point where you're not uh, making them so soft so they're vulnerable to damage, but soft enough so that they curve over the obstacle. You might have a rock like this, and it curves, you have more traction, you have more surface area of the tyre on the obstacle, giving you better traction. More tyre footprint means better traction, but it also means that the bulging sidewall is vulnerable to damage. In this case, pressures have been dropped about 50% from normal. There you go. 1.7 bar. Now let's see the difference. Now let's try something with our Range Rover. This time, rubber tyres are going to try and grip on wood. Well, that's off-roading for you. This is the exception that proves the rule. Extraordinary thing, it seemed to make things worse, but the principle remains. Lower tyre pressures give more grip and soften the ride on rough and undulating terrain. On sand, low pressures are essential to prevent the tyres sinking down. Rough tracks that traverse the Kooka land in northern Namibia, the corrugations are particularly bad. Reducing tyre pressures can help here too. Corrugations. 
One of the things you got to put up with on trails. <laughs> hate corrugations. I hate corrugations. <laughs> there are miles of them. And they never end. And it's getting really bad, so it's a little trick, but just eases the pain just a little bit. Let the tire pressures down a bit. One of the things about corrugations. It's tire pressures. If the tires are too hard, shakes the vehicle around like crazy. Let them down about 10 to 15 percent of normal pressures. These are at 2.8. Take them down to about 2.2. Okay, 2.3. It'll just soften the ride and uh, the vehicle won't dance around quite as much as it was doing before. <sighs> Corrugations are terrible. That turn of the camera, I've got to replace my teeth. It actually made a difference, you know. It actually made quite a big difference. It's made a huge difference. I think I'll have a seat. Before venturing off-road, it's a very good idea to get to know your vehicle. For example, vehicles with solid axles have their differentials protruding. With this Land Rover, the lowest part aligns with the driver's left shoulder. Have a look at your vehicle and find the lowest point and know where it is. And there's the approach angle. How easy is it going to be to climb a slope without touching? The departure angle. How steep can the slope be before part of the vehicle strikes the ground? And the breakover angle. What kind of hump can the vehicle traverse? And axle articulation. Lots of it will mean that the wheels will stay on the ground. When driving over rough terrain, try and pass the wheels over the highest objects. If you try and pass by, this can happen, threatening the most vulnerable part of any four-wheel drive, the tyre sidewall. It's this kind of misjudgment that can severely damage a tyre. Try and look well ahead, decide where the wheels must run to avoid an imbalance where a wheel on each axle could get trapped at the same time. This Land Cruiser driver has chosen the most obvious track, but it's too deep and it quickly gets stuck. The Defender driver here has been more cautious. Lastly, a little tip, keep your fingers and thumbs inside the rim of the steering wheel, especially when driving over rocks. If it's not, the steering wheel can jerk around and it can be quite painful. We continue building our Land Cruiser double cab. In a previous program, we fitted some new gas shock absorbers. I visited Ted Garstang, import of Bilstein high-pressure gas shocks, and asked him, why gas? Well, the, the primary reason for gas in a shock absorber uh, is a strange one. It, uh, it's really connected with um, the fact that when you push a shock absorber together, you have to accommodate the piston rod within the system, and the gas is, is uh, allowing the oil 
to compress it and, and make enough space for the piston rod to fit in, in the system. That was the reason that they started off with. But uh, the more important result is that the, the gas pressure within the shock absorber maintains a, a force on the column of oil in such a way that when the piston moves through this column of oil, it doesn't allow any cavitation, which is the formation of bubbles whilst it's doing its work. This little um, demonstration unit um, is, is, a, is a, a column of oil and you can see there's a little piston there that we move up and down and as we move this piston up and down you can clearly see that there are bubbles forming. You'll note that, um, that it becomes darker in front of the piston and lighter behind it and that's because of the increase in pressure behind and in front of it. So whilst I've been speaking here we've just been moving that piston and it's clearly moving up and down in this emulsion there of gas and oil. Now the minute we apply pressure to this I want you to note that the, the little bubbles will, will slowly disappear. Okay, now we've, we've, we've applied a pressure of four bars to this column of oil and as you can see now, it's moving up and down and the oil is remaining completely clear. There are absolutely no bubbles in there and uh, you see there that it's just pure oil running through the system as opposed to the, the, the emulsion before. There's absolutely no cavitation there and if we now release the pressure on the column, you'll see that instantly the bubbles just reappear. That's the basic uh, difference between a gas pressure shock absorber and a non-gas pressure shock absorber. It's that ability to keep the clear oil in the system which maintains an even damping because the more bubbles you, you form in the system, the easier it is for the emulsion to pass through the valving and therefore the less damping force that comes out of it. Of course some manufacturers have attempted to um, solve this problem by making the so-called low uh, gas pressure shock absorbers and uh, yes they do work but uh, as soon as the going gets really tough then they too begin to fail because they have insufficient pressure in them to maintain uh, um, a foam free oil in the system. Um, we, we see now that um, a company like Old Man Umu has uh, introduced recently their Premier brand and their Premier brand now um, is a totally oil-filled shock absorber with a separate canister containing a separate gas chamber and therefore keeping the gas separate from the oil much as Bilstein has done since its inception and uh, um, they are really now just saying that that is the better way to make it otherwise that wouldn't be their premium brand. Bilstein shock absorbers have, um, they are monotube shocks and one of the things that they do have is they cunningly design their separate gas canister into the same tube. So this clear area here below the dividing piston there, that, that piston is a movable piston. You can see it move up and down um, when, when we, we move the, the piston up and down here. That's got the gas below it and the oil above it. So Bilstein package that separate gas chamber into one tube. It happens to be nitrogen and nitrogen was chosen because it's inert and because it's, it's inexpensive. And of course the other reason for that is that um, being an inert gas it would prevent any form of corrosion or degradation of the, of the material because they are, they are steel cylinders. Here's an idea. Take the old shocks, wrap them in some cloth and take them with you. One front and one back. Tie them with some heavy cable ties, three or four of them, onto the top of the chassis frame. In this way, in the event of a failure or breakage, you're always carrying a spare. I've learned through sore experience how valuable it is to keep the air that is going into the engine as clean as possible. And that's the reason why I'm here now at Bailey's Off-Road, fitting a safari snorkel. I don't like wading in deep water, and obviously a uh, snorkel will help prevent damage to an engine from water. But to me, the most valuable part about this particular product is it's keeping the air cool and it's keeping the air clean. Stuart, I want to fit a safari snorkel onto my vehicle. Why do you think it's a good idea that I do it? 
I think it's um, a raised air intake, I think is must probably a better word to use. Okay. So when you think snorkel, you think flippers, goggles. Okay, fair so. enough. Yeah. <laughs> so. okay. Why must I put one of these in the car? <clears throat> the biggest kill of off-road engines is dust. Mm -hmm. Okay, not so much water uh, as a lot of people believe it should be, but should the time come when you're doing a river crossing, at least you know you've got, you're guaranteed that your air intake is now higher than originally inside the engine bay. Um, in a convoy situation, you'll find that most of your heavy dust particles are basically bonnet high. And most um, vehicles, their air intake is pulled from inside the engine bay, normally inside from an in inner fender. You're getting the heat generated by the motor, mm -hmm. heat coming through from, from the radiator. Then you're getting the heat coming up from the ground mm -hmm. as well, depending on what services you're getting. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of heat generated here. Mm -hmm. Putting a, a snorkel on, uh, um, it's normally roughly about 15 degrees cooler, no matter what the ambient of the day is, your outer temperature. And plus you're getting all your, only your fine dust particles. And depending which air cleaner you're going to be putting on the top, you're going to be putting a cyclonic filter, it then eliminates and collects a lot of the finer dust that is collected in the bowl. There is obviously a money saving here because now, if I've got an <coughs> ordinary air filter that lasts me, say, 20,000 kilometers, How's it, that's going to increase, that, what, 60,000, 80, where is it, how's it going to change things? The only way I can describe, we did it uh, for a leading mining company, they did a, um, a little test for us over a three month period with three normally aspirated diesel uh, buckies. And um, they gained, they were, their filter life was threefold. Um, with, the, with the snorkels, and they, f they said they got an extra a 2Ks a litre. Um, consumption. Consumption. Okay, that is obviously depending, that I think is depending on how people drive, so I wouldn't use that as a, as a ballpark yeah. figure. That, But I think the biggest thing that you want to do is, is, is you want your engine to last longer. And the only way you're going to get that to do is, is to eliminate the dust out of uh, your air intake. So okay. I'm going to fit one, <clears throat> okay, and then I'm going to I'm going to take it to the Richards Felt. And I'm going to do some experiments with it, okay, and we'll see what happens. And I can show you some dust just from driving around Joburg. Yeah, it's in there now. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> mm. No. Where did this, how did, look at that this. is three months worth of driving around basically Joburg, a couple of dirt roads. It's incredible. <coughs> <coughs> Amazing. Couldn't, can't believe it. We had a very pleasant, if a little bit wet night, it's still raining here in the Kalahari last night. And uh, today we're heading off to, uh, well, further, further west, to um, one of the pans in the area. This is typical Kalahari pan country. And we'll be heading off and we'll, we'll spend the next two nights and we'll find a, a campsite on the edge of the pan and um, we'll go exploring. But first, breakfast. Yeah. 
Andrew, do you carry a picture of your family in your wallet? Yes. Well, let me show you what I carry. The Queen herself, I mean the vehicle. And uh, that's my old Belinda bargain. And I was standing upright under that wheel. Driving through mile upon mile of grassland poses a threat to our convoy. The threat of fire. If enough grass gets caught underneath anywhere close to the exhaust pipe, it can easily ignite. And when it does, the fire is usually so intense that it destroys the vehicle. I thought we'd better check the vehicles for grass fire. It's the first clear patch I could the three fire extinguishers in the in the in the convoy, two types. This is a CO2. It's uh, more versatile in that it can be used um, in short bursts and doesn't have to be recharged every time. Um, it's also lighter in weight and just as effective. The uh, the other one, and this is the most common, carried in four x four vehicles. It's a powder uh, a powder charge unit. The big disadvantage with power charge units is that in the vehicle, they sit there, imagine the vehicle, they're sitting there and they're rattling, you know, with the shaking of the vehicle, the powder settles and compacts and solidifies. Every six months, minimum every six months, you take it, you turn it upside down and you shake it. Once you've discharged it, even for five seconds, you must recharge it. Keep them in a handy place, uh, behind the driver's seat somewhere where the driver, preferably, can get to it very quickly. And they're quick. Mm -hmm. You know, defenders are generally not bad at this. Got a little bit of bath on the back here. It's not bad, but careful, sweetie. Yeah, on the prop shaft. Here's a whole heap for you, lot. Pull it out here. Yeah, it's not just a joy ride, you know, kids. Yeah. It's not on there, but I need to get a stick or something and pull all the stuff. You know, the idea is to get you get to know your vehicle. Once you've done a couple of trips like this, you know where it tends to catch. If you've got a new vehicle, unfamiliar vehicle, be very sorry. Yeah, I've got a problem here. I've got a problem here. I need a stick. That packed like that around the exhaust pipe. That's a lot of grass. Maybe better to use a stick than a than a screwdriver. This over here is my oil intercooler. So although I might not see the temperature come up on the radiator, the, oil, the water temperature, the oil might start getting hot. I'm just. Now one of the things is if you have to clean out seeds in a radiator, never use water. Water, especially if you're going to fire it from the front, because water will push the seeds in further and make them expand. It will make things even worse. Our journey continues. We set up camp next to a small pan on which wildflowers lay scattered like decorations on a birthday cake. This is the beauty of this kind of travel. We've just come across this pan. It is covered with the most delightful flowers. And I'm thinking maybe we, we camp here. It's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, stop, stop, everyone, stop. That lizard is actually bigger than mine. Stop. There's a lizard. Who wants to see a lizard? What's the feeling? You'd like to camp here. I want to camp here. Um, please may we camp here?